you, Jerry. Hello, I'm Tim Barons, and welcome to Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. I try to get out gospel tracks to as many people a day here in Las Vegas and around the world with my friend Mike Cahill. Mike pointed out that we've been on 44 or 45 trips. And uh, hearing that uh, fellow talking about the Muslims a few moments ago reminded me of our trip to Germany where the uh, 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 Islamic or the Arabic or the, the Turkish Muslims were more open to gospel tracts than the Germans. In fact, I remember one of the, uh, the Muslims asking me, uh, what religion does this represent? And I said, well, this is a religion where you don't have to kill somebody to get to heaven. He said, oh, okay. <laughs> he took the track. And uh, so it's just been a joy. We were at uh, a couple of cities this time. Cancun, and I know you're all rolling your eyes. Oh, Cancun, yeah. How long did you spend on the beach? Well, we didn't even see the beach. Uh, and also uh, Vera Cruz, we were also there. And Mike clocked it on his uh, his uh, wristwatch that we walked 27 miles in three days. That's nine miles a day and for somebody who's 72 and a half and that's my age uh, I'm so grateful the Lord gave me strength and for your prayers they really really made a difference when we got off the uh, got off the plane in Cancun we had uh, we had 4,000 tracks with us we were able to get out 3,000 in Cancun and and uh, 1,000 in Veracruz. If you'd like to see and read what we read or we, we handed out it was Mary's kids and you can read it at chick.com. We hand it out in Spanish course. And, uh, but uh, Mike, uh, we get off the plane and Mike starts handing out the, uh, the copies of Mary's Kids to people in the airport. And I'm thinking, man, if a government official is here, this could, this could be, you know, could cause problems. And he hands one to a cab driver. And this guy is just elated. He said, are you guys Christian or Catholic? And we said, Christian. He said, man, can I have some of those to take into the prison? And uh, <laughs> he said, in fact, if you have some in English, I'd love to take some of uh, the English ones in. There's, there's Americans in that prison. And I thought, Lord, you're so cool. Uh, if it had been up to me, we would have never met the guy. But uh, God has used Mike so many times. And, and I'm so grateful to him for helping me out with these tricks, trips because I'm basically on Social Security and a few folks help out every month. But uh, if you can help out, uh, if the trip costs around $4,000, I try to raise my half to be 2000 And uh, I'd be grateful uh, to you if, if you could help us out. Uh, uh, the, the address, Tim Barron's, B-E-R, and then the word ends, B-E-R-E-N-D-S, Post Office Box 24091. Post Office Box 24091, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89101, 89101. I know you're supposed to do that at the end, but I thought I'm, in, I'm 72 and a half. Sometimes I forget, and I wanted to get that out of the way while we, while we could. Well, uh, the Lord was so good. Um, we then uh, spent a day in uh, Veracruz. My sister, who lived in Central and South America, says the, the cartel owns Veracruz. <laughs> and uh, who knows? We might have gotten uh, some of the tracks to some of the cartel members. But uh, I asked uh, a fellow in Cancun about the State Department travel warning there is about going to Cancun. He says, well, the cartels fight amongst the drugs that they would give to the tourists. He said, if you're not doing drugs, you don't have to worry about anything. So uh, when we were at the hotel, a fellow told us the, the areas where the most people were, and I don't think we even gave a, a track to a tourist. But uh, the people, 98% of the people took the tracks. As I said, I much prefer handing out tracks in Mexico, Central and South America, and Africa than America any day. I love America. I love America more than any other nation. But as far as handing out gospel tracks, now I'm going to be on the bridge here when I get off the program, the MGM, um, uh, let's see, MGM New York, New York Bridge for about, I'm going to try to stay out an hour. Uh, <laughs> it's a long time with this heat. But I uh, would appreciate your prayers for that. But I would say I'll maybe get 30% acceptance, maybe 40% acceptance. But you never know. And uh, on the back it says five free movies, fullyfreefilms.com. So sometimes I'll say if, you're, if you know of anybody who's suicidal, uh, this is a great movie for them, and it's free, and get that in their hands. Of course, we're the secret suicide capital 
of, uh, of the United States. As Wayne Allen Root sent on his program a couple of weeks ago, he had some police officers he was talking to. Well, there's a suicide a day in the uh, in the hotels. And of course, you never hear that. That's, that's bad for business. They'd like you to believe what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But God knows. But uh, we're uh, reading... Um, how to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts by Ray Comfort. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book uh, that uh, you need to get in the hands of people who are depressed, or maybe if you're depressed, you can get it through livingwaters.com. And uh, make sure you watch that movie on suicide called Exit. And you can see it at fullyfreefilms.com, fully freefilms.com. You can see it free. If you know anybody struggling with homosexuality, there's a wonderful movie called Audacity. I'm 72 and a half. I've never seen in my whole life uh, a Christian movie on homosexuality, dealing with homosexuality. And, uh, and Ray's done it and just is so tasteful. They have one on evolution. If you're a uh, an evolutionist, you will not be if you have a brain in your head after watching Evolution versus God. And you can see that at FullyFreeFilms.com. So uh, let's continue on with How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts by Ray Comfort. This is a fictional account. He says, your eye suddenly catches the frightening sight of a man perched on the ledge of San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, poised to jump. What do you say to him? In a sense, his life is in your hands. Such is the case when a caring bystander tries to convince a suicidal young man that his life has value and he has much to live for in this moving fictional account. Will the bystander be able to address the man's true needs and talk him down? Would you be able to offer a ray of hope and some comfort to someone without any? Includes helpful, hope-filled sidebars from the world's best counselor. Talking about Jesus. All right, let's go to Chapter 7. This is entitled, No Excuse. By now, I was sure that there had been divine intervention. As I glanced over my shoulder, I could see that drivers were looking in our direction as they sped past. I was eager for us both to get down off the bridge and wanted to share one more analogy with my friend. I no longer had any interest taking a sunrise picture. There was something of far more value that I was concerned about. John, there's one more thought I'd like to leave with you. May I? Sure, he replied, suddenly sounding a little anxious. You're not going to leave me, are you? I'm beginning to... Of course not. I just want to tell you a true story about a little village in Italy that sits in a deep valley surrounded by snow-capped mountains. The village, Viganella, is hidden from the sunshine for three freezing months of every year. And those three sunless months are not only cold, they tend to be gloomy and depressing. depressing. However, the local residents had a bright idea, I explained. They installed a giant mirror on the mountainside, and it reflected the warmth of sunlight directly into the heart of that dark little town. John, I know your life right now seems to be dark, gloomy, and depressing. Life is filled with pain, suffering, and death. But the Bible says that to those who sat in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Heaven shone its glorious light down to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, the one who said, I am the light of the world. Even in the midst of this world's darkness, God has given us light, the light of the glorious gospel. Those who draw near to God can bask in the warmth of his love. If you turn from your sins and trust in Christ, Jesus promises that you will never walk in darkness again. Does that make sense? John was silent for a few moments and asked, You know what? What? Everything is starting to make sense, he said slowly. I don't mean about my dad and the other issues that seemed so important. I mean everything makes sense that you've said about God, my sins, and what Jesus did on the cross. I have no excuse for the things I've done. I feel physically sick at what I've become. I even accused Almighty God of being evil. For the first time in my life, I understand what happened on that cross. That was the payment for my sin. Could you pray for me right now? John pleaded. I want to pray, but I can't. I can't face God. I've never in my life had such an overwhelming desire to kill myself as I do right now. Mr. Spock is screaming in my head for me to jump. Seriously, please pray, he exclaimed, his voice shaking. I bowed my head and earnestly prayed, Father, 
In the name of Jesus, I stand against every work of darkness. I break every principality and power in John's life through faith in the name of Jesus. Please help him. I pray that at this very moment, light will flood his soul and that by your mercy and your amazing grace, he will pass from death to life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dear God, I, I, I killed my own child, John began praying, sounding much calmer now with a refreshing honesty he opened his heart to his creator i've hated my father i've used other people for my own selfish needs i've incessantly lied and stolen and been filled with sexual fantasies help me to get up out of this pigsty you gave me life yet i used your name as a cuss word i've sinned against you please forgive me thank you for what you did on the cross i put my trust in jesus christ as my savior from this day forward i will live for him in his name i pray amen his eyes which moments before darted with fear were now peaceful and resolute would you be kind enough to take my hand and help me up i want to get away from this place i have things to do that's chapter 7. We're reading from How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts by Ray Comfort. You can get a copy at livingwaters.com. Chapter 8, Out of the Mouths of Lions. The following day, as I waited near the counter in my favorite burger restaurant, I was delighted to see a familiar face approaching. John, I'm so pleased you can make it, I said with a broad smile as I gave him a hug. Like I mentioned yesterday, I have a few important things I want to share with you. Among other things, I wanted to make sure he was okay, but he was far better than that. For the first time, I saw a smile on his face, and his eyes were clear and bright and full of life. How could I not come? I love burgers, especially in and out Yesterday, I was miserable and wanted to kill myself, and today, I'm a Christian being treated to in and out gone from hell to heaven in 24 hours. He paused to ponder the dual meaning of that thought and added, literally, I can't believe what's happened. Seriously, what you told me was the truth, and I'm excited to hear more. Did you want onions? There's such a crowd. I took the liberty of placing your order just before you got here. Yes, thanks, John said. You know what I did yesterday? I went home to my mom. I called her first, and when I told her what had happened, that I'd become a Christian, she burst into tears. Well, we both did. I told her I was so sorry for all the pain that I had caused her. When I got off the bus near the apartment, she was standing at the gate looking for me. When she saw me, she ran toward me and hugged me. It was just like that story Jesus told of the father running to his son. Incredible. I couldn't stop smiling as John spoke. He hardly took a breath between sentences. Hold that thought, I said. Here's your meal. Let's get out of this noise and eat outside. I noticed a table under a tree. He just smiled slightly, took the food, and carried on, speaking with the same wide intensity. And you won't believe this. After dinner, I dug out my old Bible and was reading it. The Bible. John flashed a big grin as he paused and shook his head as if he couldn't believe it either. I spent hours reading it and hardly slept a wink last night. I read Psalm 139 and it was so amazing I kept reading it over and over. Well, I don't mean I read just that psalm for hours, John chuckled, then continued. It says that God knows me from my birth. I never said one word without him being aware of it. He created me in my mother's womb, it says. You know what? The fact that God sees me doesn't freak me out anymore. I don't feel any guilt. Realizing that he sees me makes me feel good, knowing I'm not alone. Am I talking too much? Not at all, I laughed. This is making my day. But you're going to have to hold that thought again. Let's give thanks for the food to the Lord. John was seated and, without saying a word, clasped his hands together and once again furrowed his brow. I was about to open my mouth when he beat me to it. Dear God, we're so grateful for this day, for the sunrise, for my mom, and for saving me from such a terrible death. His voice cracked slightly. And thank you for my new friend, for the sound of birds, for music and color, for Jesus and the cross, oh, and for this food. Amen. Amen. The smell of the fries was suddenly overpowering. I picked one up and placed it on my grateful taste buds. John didn't miss a beat. He continued, I had read parts of the Bible a few times when I was in church as a kid, but last night it was like it was a different book. I couldn't put it down. I felt like a kid in a candy store. Because you're different, 
God gave you a new heart and put his spirit within you. So you'll find you now have different desires. The way the Bible puts it is you've been born again and are now a new creature in Christ, I said. You ain't kidding. Brand new. It's just like a totally new world has opened up to me. I can't stop thinking about Jesus and what he did on the cross for me. And you know what? I've been saying praise the Lord and meaning it. You know, not in mockery. I smiled again. That's wonderful. I have so many questions for you, but I also have one really very big fear. What's that? I'm afraid that I'll lose what I found. It's a little weird to say this, but I can't describe the feeling of joy, and I have a peace that I've, I've never had before. You've no worries there, I assured him. You have God's promises that he will never leave you ever. Not even death can separate you from him. Wow, really? That's incredible, John. Let a sigh of relief. Okay, first question, the big one I've been thinking about. What am I going to do if I get depressed? If Mr. Spock starts again telling me to end it all, how should I deal with thoughts of suicide? Well, let's look at the suicide aspect first. Are you familiar with the story of the Philippian jailer, I asked? I've heard that they have harsh jail sentences for drug users. One of my old friends got two years for less than a half ounce of weed. No, Philippian, not the Philippines. It's a story in the Bible about a jailer who wanted to commit suicide because he thought he messed up at his job. Seriously? Just because he messed up? Yes, his employer had a rule that if you blew it, you were put to death, and he thought that he had blown it. John's eyes sparkled with interest. Okay, you have me hooked. Give me the details. It's in the book of Acts. Two Christians were beaten and th thrown into prison for upsetting the locals. What did they do? They cast a demon out of a girl. She had been following them for a long time, yelling out stuff, and one of the Christians, a man named Paul, lost his patience and cast out the demon. Do you really believe in that sort of thing, a literal demon? The words caught the ear of the young woman sitting behind John. She was sporting devilish tattoos and had brass rings through her nose and in her bottom lip. She turned around slightly and gave a strange look, first at John and then at me. I managed a courtesy smile and answered his question. I could tell that she was straining to hear my answer above the noise of the patio. Of course, the Bible has a lot to say on the subject. Anyway, Paul and his friend were, well, they were beaten and their feet were locked in stocks and they lay in a cold, dark dungeon, bleeding from their wounds. You know what they did? They sang praises to God. John looked genuinely mystified. That's a little weird. Why would they do that? Well, even in what some may think was a hopelessly depressing situation, they trusted him. Whatever happens to a Christian happens only by God's permissive will. It may not be his perfect will, but he's permitted it because he can work it out for the Christian's good. More ketchup? Sure, thanks. I sat speechless as I watched him pick up all three of the remaining paper cups of ketchup and smother not more than a dozen fries and saw them disappear under a sea of red sauce. He continued, but how on earth could getting beaten up and sitting bloodied and in pain in the cold dungeon work out for their good. Can't see that happening. I smiled and said, would you like to hear what did happen? Of course. They're sitting in prison singing hymns. Let me read it to you. Hang on. I have a Bible on my phone. As I reached for my phone, John licked ketchup from his thumb. Here's another thing that's weird. You know what I like to do? I fry an egg and slip it in between the patties. An Aussie made me one once. Now I do it all the time, he commented as he bit into his burger. I love eggs. Ah, here it is. Acts 16.25. Tell you what, take my phone and you read it out loud. This burger's got me salivating. Okay, verse 25? Yes, verses 25 through 31. John began reading aloud. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keepers of the prison, waking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. So this is the guy who was going to commit suicide? Why would he do that? He was a Roman jailer, I explained. 
between bites. Under Roman law, if a guard lost his prisoners, he was put to death for failing his responsibility. Or worse, he would suffer the punishment that was due to his prisoners. It was an effective way to make sure everyone was diligent when guarding prisoners. If his were gone, come sunrise, he would suffer some grisly death as an example to other jailers who might decide to free condemned prisoners. So he decided to speed up the process. And that makes sense, John nodded. Then he resumed his reading. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Wow, how cool. I set my burger down for a moment. So when the Philippian jailer was going to kill himself, Paul stopped him. He called out, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. Kind of like what you did for me, John inserted, right? But... Think about this. Why did Paul call out? He had a good reason for remaining silent and letting the jailer kill himself. The doors were open, and that would have been one less obstacle on the way out. But suicide is never a good choice. It is a harmful choice. This was a human being made in the image of God, and Paul couldn't let the man take his own life. So what does that mean? John asked as he took a bite and awaited the answer. What does that mean? Caught with a mouthful, John responded with a muffled, made in the image of God. After he quickly sw swallowed, he added, you mentioned that yesterday, too. It means that God created us in his likeness with some of his attributes. We're aware of his existence, conscientiousness. We can appreciate music and beauty, love and laughter. We have a sense of morality and with it an intuitive passion for justice. Animals don't set up court systems and prosecute other animals that violate some law they've put in place, but humans do. We're unique in creation. Wow. I seem to be saying wow a lot later, lately. I never thought about the difference. I've been told that we're all animals, the whole evolution thing. And if you read further, I added, you'll see that the jailer and his whole family came to Christ, and he ended up tending to Paul and Silas's wounds. Then the Romans let them go. So it did work out for their good. Amazing, yes. And there's reason, the reason no one should ever think about committing suicide. A fry on its way to John's mouth paused midair as he asked quizzically, How do you mean? Then it found its target. Think of what happened. The jailer thought he had good reason to kill himself. The doors were open, so he naturally assumed the prisoners were gone. Life was over. He would never see his beloved family again and would be put to death. It was a hopeless situation. So he may as well do it himself and get it over with. But he was wrong. He was not alone. The prisoners were still there. When God is in the equation... What may seem to be a hopeless, depressing, and impossible situation isn't. This is because with God, nothing is impossible. I smile as I thought of John's comment when we first met, that convincing him life was worth living was an impossible task. Truly, nothing is impossible with God. Well, we hope to conclude the program, conclude the book, Next week, How to Battle Depression and Suicidal Thoughts by Ray Comfort. You can get a copy of it at livingwaters.com. And you can see the movie Exit, which deals with suicide, free movie, by going to fullyfreefilms.com, fullyfreefilms.com. And then if you're on the verge of suicide, there are people praying for you right now. Today's program, Brandon will have it up here in a couple of days, and also last week's program, Lord willing. Just go to on YouTube, Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zach, for your help on the board. God bless you, my friends. Pray for me as I hit the bridge with gospel tracks to reach a lost and dying world. Bye-bye.